So ladies and gentlemen, it's now time for the one you've all been waiting for. Would you please put your hands together for the best man! So my name's Rich, and I tell you what, it was weird seeing Dan so stressed out on the run-up to the big days. Not normally in his nature, but I kept what saying to him, reassuring him, look, mate, everyone you love most in the world is going to be there to help you celebrate, and you're going to have the time of your life. And I was quite right, because the stag do was amazing. <laughs> so just before the stag, I asked Dan to choose a fancy dress theme, and he chose wrestlers. Which is tough and embarrassing for anybody, but especially if you built like a 12 year old girl like I am. But then I don't know if it was bravery or stupidity, but Dan said that I could choose his outfit for him. And the resulting wet look metallic gold leotard was a real sight for sore eyes. I've got a phone full of images, so if anybody in the room wants a sneaky peek, just buy me a pint and I'll reveal all just. Be warned, that leotard left very little to the imagination. Now, before we get into the moment that you've all been waiting for, which is obviously the right royal roasting of Dan Stanbridge, I want to do a couple of shout outs myself. So, I'm going to be talking about her royal loveliness, Queen Joanna, later on in the speech. So, I'll jump straight for the parents, Pete and Ruth and Brendan Denise, on behalf of everybody, once again, thanks for your help putting on this phenomenal day and for sculpting Dan and Joanna into two of the coolest people on the planet. Um, I was also going to give a personal, very personal thanks to Brent and Denise because growing up Dan was my brother from another mother. <laughs> the Stanbridge household was my home from home so genuinely, well from the bottom of my heart, thanks for your love and hospitality. Um, Obviously, I also wanted to give a big thanks to the ushers, the three M's, Mike, Matt and Martin. Uh, triple trouble, so a big thanks to the lads and to Tony Smith. Tony, give us a wave. Big thanks to all those lads for helping to make Dan's now legendary stag do an event to remember. Well, kind of remember. <laughs> And finally, I wanted to give a shout out to the bridesmaids and the bridesmen, so Joanna's posse. Aside from doing a remarkable job in keeping Joanna's sanity in check, I congratulate them for injecting back all the glamour and class into today's proceedings that the ushers sucked out of them. So, well done, you deserve a medal for that. Um, and they all look so stunningly lovely uh, that they absolutely deserve a huge wolf whistle. But sadly, I'm not very good at whistling, but I do know a man who is. So, Usher Martin, do us the honours. One more time, then, ladies and gents. Let, let's do uh, my first uh, toast. Let's thank the whole wedding party for their efforts today. So, raise your glasses and repeat after me. Cheers! Cheers! <laughs> right, so I've known, I've been best buddies with Dan for literally as long as I can remember. And over the years, the guy has been such a phenomenal idiot <laughs> that I, I've got hundreds of stories I can tell. <laughs> In fact, I found it so hard to pick the stories that I'd tell that, you know what, I did. I didn't pick a single story. So I'm going to do something a bit different, which is I'm going to ask Dan to pick the, story, the stories that I'd tell. Okay, so specific, <coughs> specifically, um, I've armed each table with a rolled up scroll of paper, and that's actually the front page yeah, can you all hoist them aloft if you have one, just to check that I did this for you, good. That's actually the front page of a newspaper where the headline represents a story from Dan's dim, very, very dim and distant past. And so I'm going to ask Dan to choose the three stories he's most happy for me to tell, and it ain't going to be easy because some of those stories, they, they, they make your toes curl. So uh, let's show Dan his options. If you've got a the, the newspaper, please stand up, untie the ribbon, and show down the options. <laughs> okay, so just to share, share the titles with everybody, and buy down So to buy down a bit of valuable thinking time. Guys, guys, to buy... 
Dubai Dancing Valley Boys and Indian Time. Can I ask everybody to shout out their headline? Starting at the back left, if you will, mate. Loud and proud. A wee tot of whiskey. A wee tot of whiskey, then. <laughs> uh, next up, please. E.T. Bone Home. <laughs> Dan would be a maniac to pick that one. <laughs> Next. I should be so lucky. I should be so lucky. Mike? Teach us all the hole of the moon. Te uh, incidentally, in that context, the spelling of hole oh. is appropriate. So maybe just pick it up on that one. Um, that's over. Sexy, sexy, hole. <laughs> that's my mum. <laughs> 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 Pardon my French. Uh, breaking up is a hard thing to do. Breaking up is hard to do, Matt. The son, the daughter, the cat, and the wardrobe. Grooving <laughs> 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 no. with the Grovers. Dan, for the sake of both of our dignities, please choose wisely, mate. Where am I going first? Which story am I going first? <laughs> None. <laughs> Um, oh. <laughs> uh, grooving with the Grovers. Gro grooving with the Ladies and gents, thank you. Sit down. I'll call you up for a few moments' time. Sorry. Grooving with the Grovers. <laughs> right, so, um, because we're two lovely, sensitive fellas, me and Dan spent a good portion of our teenage years doing voluntary work with the mentally handicapped, and so for every Thursday, me and Dan would head to Grove Cottage in Bishop Storford, which was a home for special people or a centre for the mentally challenged. I'm not sure what the politically correct term is, but I'm sure it isn't the nut house, as Dan used to call it. <laughs> I feel like I'm painting Dan in an unnecessary dim light because he loved working here, let me, truthfully. The people who attended the Grove, who we used to call the Grovers, were unique and wonderful and there was never a dull moment. So me and Dan used to go down and help out with art classes or little culinary courses. And as I'm sure Dan will remember, we once put on a pizza making work. Oh yeah! <laughs> And the pizzas that the Grovers made were extraordinary. I mean, the pizza base was this thick, you know, a normal thing for us pizza, but the toppings were this. I mean, it looked like a cake when it came out the other. <laughs> anyway, Dan was handed a, a, a slice that was too, too thick to put in his mouth. So he popped it on a plate and cut into it, and underneath the layers of cheese was a whole unpeeled onion. <laughs> Anyway, one year we decided to put on a big Christmas extravaganza, a talent show, and we invited members of the public. About 120 people showed up to watch. For the show, each volunteer teamed up with a Grover to put on a performance. I teamed up with one of the Lady Grovers to deliver an ear-splitting rendition of Summer Lovin'. For it was awful. I just cringe thinking about that. But Dan teamed up with our very favourite. Grover, what was his name, Dan? Nigel. Nigel, yeah, Grover Nigel. Dan and Nigel decided to put on a stand-up comedy routine. I mean, what could go wrong with that? <laughs> Dan's plan for the routine there was that Dan would set up a classic joke, and then Nigel would deliver the punchline. It was simple, bulletproof, and they'd practice for hours and hours to get it, to make sure it went well on the night. Yet yeah, on the night, the routine was hilarious for all of the wrong reasons. <laughs> Dan did what he was supposed to. He'd read out a joke from a cue card, but instead of reading out the appropriate punchline, Nigel just randomly made up every answer. <laughs> I've got the whole routine on video at home, and I'd love to have shown you it to today, but I've done the next best thing, which is actually, I've transcribed, I've jotted down a couple of the jokes. Oh. So we'll relive a couple of them. Right? <laughs> Anyway, so at one point, Dad, Dan, Dad, <laughs> Dan, Dan read out, what do you call a deer that cannot see? Uh, and the answer to that is, ladies and gents? No idea. No idea, thank you. Classic, crappy, cracker joke material, right? But anyway, on the night, Dan said, what do you call a deer that cannot see? And Nigel shouted, Graham Rogers. <laughs> Graham Rogers. <laughs> and dear, you can't see how wonderfully surreal. <laughs> and I said, next up, Dan told a related joke, which is what you call a blind dinosaur. And the answer to that is, anyone? Do you think he saw us? Do you think he saw us? 
here, tragically on the night, Dan said, what do you call a blind dinosaur? And Nigel responded, a brontosaurus with a hat on. <laughs> It was amazing. This, this went on for 20 minutes. Dan grew redder and redder with every failed joke. 120 people in the audience were silent, dumbfounded. Just occasionally turning to each other thinking, how the hell am I meant to react to this? There were just two people in that room laughing, which was me and Hedda Shamat Davis. At the back of the room, absolutely wet themselves. No, seeing Dan floundering on stage for the most excruciating 20 minutes of his life will always be one of our very most treasured memories. <laughs> so there we go. Dan, time to pick story number two. So ladies and gents, if, if you hold the paper, please stand up. Let's show the rabbit to the greyhound. Wardrobe! As it were. Wardrobe! No! <laughs> no, definitely not that So Dan, Wardrobe. once again, mate, are you ready to pick, uh, pick story number two? Uh, just because it doesn't sound so bad. Pardon my French. Yeah. Pardon my French. Pardon. Thank you, ladies and gents. Please sit down. Don't get too comfy. This is quite a quick fire one. But this one. Right. So, pardon my French. Now, at school, Dan was generally a good boy, but just like he does now, he loved a bit of mischief. And he once got into big trouble because he'd written something rude in tiny, tiny letters at the top of his French GCSE homework. Now, he handed that in, hoping that the teacher wouldn't notice it, but of course she did. And not only was Dan given detention, he was told to write an le a letter of apology to the teacher. Oh! <laughs> Guess what, ladies and gents, I've got a very special surprise, because after the teacher read the letter, I stole it from her desk. <laughs> I, have it here with uh, I knew that keeping this sort of crap would come in handy. Uh, does anybody want me to read it out? Oh. Yes. Here we go. So it's, it opens with, dear Miss, oh, sorry, dear Mr. Shoon, oh. I am sorry for what I've done. <laughs> what? What? Uh, I mean, how Dan? How are you hoping to learn French when you haven't mastered it? <laughs> I am sorry for what I've done, and I promise it won't happen again. In hindsight, it was inappropriate of me to have written at the top of my homework, Poo Bum Women. <laughs> and then it's a very formal sign off that yours sincerely, Daniel Stan. I mean, it's extraordinary. Poo Bum Willie. Dan was nearly 17. <laughs> Up. <laughs> right, so that's it, that's it guys. So the third and final story. Let's let's make this a good one. Uh, paper holders, you know the score. Please be upstanding for the final one. Wardrobe! Wardrobe! No! Wardrobe! 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 This one, but I don't know, it's something you mentioned a long time ago. No. Break up is hard We're going with it. Yeah, definitely. Let's... Dan, genuinely, do you, do you know what this one could be about? I think it was when, I tried to, when we had a free period. Right, well, he's a very brave man. Let me warn you, everybody here. But, right, here we go. This is... <laughs> so, the title for this one, ladies and gentlemen, was Breaking Up Is Hard To Do, and in his later life, Dan became something of a Lothario, a bit of a ladies' man, and of course the best evidence of that comes from the fact he's bagged himself such a wonderful wine today. <laughs> um, but it's not always been like that at all. In fact, it was a long time before Dan got his first girlfriend, and that was largely because during his teenage years, he looked exactly like a Latino Mr. B. <laughs> time he was 16, Dan had moved on to his second girlfriend, and by now his confidence with the ladies was through the roof. He was eager to move on to pastures new to sow his wild oats, but he'd never dumped a girl before or anything remotely like it. And so at school, Dan asked me and again Matt Dale for two bits of, for, for some advice, and we told him two things. We said, look, one, 
She's a really nice girl, so I help her respect you should finish with her in person, or at the very least over the phone. Do not do it in a letter or a fax. <laughs> because it was the 90s, right? <laughs> And then we told him, the second bit of advice we gave him was to think carefully about what you're going to say. Think it through in your head, or even jot down a couple of notes. Because it will help you not bottle it at the last minute, or say something stupid that unnecessarily upsets her. Now, me and Matt, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, we were hardly Hugh Hefner. I mean, we weren't amazing with the women ourselves, but that's two reasonable bits of advice, right? Well, Dan took it on board and then took it to the next level, because rather than just jotting down a few notes, he wrote a full script. And so the next day, he told us how he'd called her up, read out the script, word for word, verbatim, and then boom, hung up. <laughs> Well, ladies and gents, I've got another very special surprise for you. <laughs> because here, in my mortal hand, I have that script. Every word of it was penned by Dan's fair hand, and you can tell because it looks like it was written by a backwards toddler. <laughs> in fact, on that note, Denise, can you please verify that is Dan's special that is Dan's very special handwriting? I might ask Joanna to verify as well. Can you Oh, well, that's Dan's handwriting. It is. I promise this is true. <laughs> you alright with this, Dan? <laughs> right, well, I guess to, to the room. Is anybody interested in me reading out this? Yes. Yes. Of course you are, you sick, sick puppies. <laughs> now, we're about to relive a pivotal moment from Dan's life. The first time he finished with a girl, brace yourself. Because it ain't tactful. And just remember, <laughs> just remember that that girl answered the phone, Dan read this out word for word, and hung up. <laughs> so Dan opens, Dan opens with, Hi, I can't be long as the phone bill has just come through. <laughs> I can't be long as the phone bill has just come through and I've got chained by my parents for being on the phone so much and I've been banned. Okay, so fair play to Dan there. Uh, he's established his escape strategy in the first sentence, which is a smart move, but I've got a question in the line. I've just been caned by my parents because I know Brendan Denise pretty well and I'm pretty sure they're aimed into corporal punishment. <laughs> and we'll let it slip. So Dan, Dan continues, he says, Truth is, I don't think we're working out. It's not you, it's me. Now, before I read that next line, because there's always a next line, um, let's, I wanted to clear something up, because I'm sure everybody in the room has heard that horrible old breakup cliche before, it's not you, it's me. I bet, in fact, I bet half the room's probably used it at some point. Um, and even though it's complete and utter bull, it comes from a good place. It's intended to save the feelings of the person you're finishing with. So you normally say, it's not you, it's me, I'm just so busy right now, I can't give you the time you deserve. Yeah. But, again, it, it comes from a good place. But, sadly, Dan didn't quite grasp that, because... <laughs> right. I quote this verbatim, this is what Dan says, It's not you, it's me. I just don't fancy you anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so it is you. Uh, <laughs> it's official, mate, you are an idiot. <laughs> so, Dan, can, Dan continues anyway, he says, Anyway, I think in relationships both have to be honest with each other, and I haven't been entirely honest with you. <laughs> I guess I'm beating around the bush here, but when I got dumped by my last girlfriend, I went out with you on the rebound. <laughs> Daniel. I've been doing a, a lot of thinking, and I feel it would be best if we separated. I don't know how you feel, but that would be best for me. <laughs> Sorry it's so sudden. That's how I feel. Right, I better go now before my parents whinge. <laughs> See ya! <laughs> Comedy gold. <laughs> There's so many good lines in that. And I just, but you do have to think about that poor girl on the end of the phone. I better hit the spin.
Well, I was thinking, Joanna, you should be very grateful that Dan loves you so much. Yeah. Otherwise, you could have been on the receiving end of one of these bad boys. <laughs> I don't even let her get a word of edge, please. <laughs> no, you didn't, did you? I mean, that's extraordinary. Okay, so, right. Dan, you picked your three stories. Story, story. Hang on, <laughs> Dan, you picked your three stories, and I'd say congratulations. That was definitely the, the best of a bad punch, so you can kick back and relax, right? <laughs> no. No, no, you <laughs> quite like it, Because I've got one more surprise <coughs> up my sleeve, because I'm going to ask Joanna to pick the last story. <laughs> So, all paper holders, one more time, please be upstanding for this super secret bonus round. Um, Joanna, for the sake of all that is good and pure, please choose wisely. Well, I am interested in sexy, sexy conga. And E.T. Bone Home sounds like an interesting tale. But I Should Be So Lucky is alluringly vague. I think Dan might know what it's about, though, eh? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, yeah, we'll go with it. Ladies and gents, thank you so much for your help. I really mean that. Right, so we've got this, uh, this is a corking story, but I can definitely see why Dan wouldn't have chosen it, because it does make him look a bit weird. <laughs> okay, so I should be so lucky. So for this story, I'm going to take you back to September 1988. <laughs> And after a seemingly endless summer holiday, we returned to primary school. At lunchtime, all of the lads sat round in a big circle in the playground and regaled each other of stories of our summers. Now, this, each of the stories the lads told were complete fabrications, big, fat lies, intended purely to impress the other boys by making our summers sound cooler than they actually were. So, for instance, and this is true, one of the lads said that he'd gotten back from holiday in the States where he'd been to the cinema to watch the latest movie, Goonies vs. the Ghostbusters. Turns out that film was never made. <laughs> Probably with very good reason. But the next lad, and again, people on that table will be able to verify this, there was a, one of the lads in the group said that his dad got back from a business trip to Japan and he brought back with him a hoverboard. So, by the way, said Back to the Future 2, and we were blown away. Whoa, can we please, please, please have a go? He said, no, the hoverboard is highly radioactive, and so we had to wrap it up in tinfoil and put it in the loft. <laughs> How very convenient. Uh, but eventually it was Dan's turn, and the lie that Dan told was so mind-bogglingly weird that we never let him live it down. It gives us a real glimpse into the curious probably psychotic mind of Dan Stanford. <laughs> As I relay this detail, please remember, ladies and gents, this was intended to impress his best friends. <laughs> That's key to the weirdness. So Dan said he'd spent the summer back in Liverpool, where he'd grown up with Brent Denise and his brother Matt. And while he was there, Dan, here over there. <laughs> and while he was there, Dan said he got to catch up with his oldest and bestest friend in the whole wide world. And so we felt pretty dejected. It was like, well, Dan, we thought we were your best mate. Who the, who the hell's this guy? Tell us about him. So Dan did. He said, well, he doesn't have any eyes or ears. <laughs> Dan continued, he said, yeah, he doesn't have any hair on his head, and he doesn't have a nose or a mouth. <laughs> By this point, obviously, we were all freaking out. But Dan ploughed on regardless. He said, yeah, he doesn't have any arms or legs, and on his body, he doesn't have any nipples or a belly button. And then, and I specifically remember Dan saying this, because we were like seven years old, and I thought, oh, that's a bit rude. But Dan said, he doesn't have a willy or a bum hole. <laughs> Quite specific that last one. <laughs> so let just to summarise then, Dan's best friend in the whole world was Mr. Potato Head. It was a, a hairless, featureless, senseless torso. <laughs> and for all the information that Dan told us about his chum, he never told us his name. So over the years the lads have affectionately referred to him as Lucky. <laughs> Lucky the Wonder Boy. <laughs> and the story of Lucky just raised so many questions. Even when we were eight years old, we couldn't understand the dynamic.